Honorable the Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Ivor Archie, Order of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago, and President of the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs, Senator the Honorable Mrs. Renuka Sagram Singh Suklal. The Honorable Justice Gillian Lucky, Justice of Appeal, Appeal Court of the Judiciary of Trinidad and Tobago, and Chairman of the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. Distinguished judges and judicial officers of the Judiciary of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, members of the Board of the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Frank Sudin, Campus Librarian, the UE St. Augustine Campus, other members of the Campus Executive Management Team, Senior University Officials and Campus Officers, Dr. Akola Lewis Cameron, Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, the UE St. Augustine Campus, Dr. Talia Esnard, Senior Lecturer and Head of the Department of Behavioral Sciences, Faculty of Social Sciences, the UE St. Augustine Campus, Mr. McDonald Jacob, Acting Commissioner of Police, Mr. Diopasad Ramuta, Acting Commissioner of Prisons, and all other representatives of the Protective Services, other distinguished representatives of the legal fraternity and representatives of state and non-state sectors of Trinidad and Tobago, the UE St. Augustine staff and students, members of the media, Distinguished guests, good evening again. It is time to stand. Time to counteract the crime and violence which seems to hold our country at ransom. It is time to unite in numbers. Time to replace the negativity with positivity. It is time to join forces with visionaries. Time to save our country time to stand together against crime and violence. It is time to end the silence. This is an excerpt taken from a poem, Time to Stand Against Crime and Violence, by Dylan Oliveri of Dominica. On behalf of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, and the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago, I welcome you to today's public lecture entitled, Is Justice Elusive? A Perspective from the Criminal Justice System. My name is Carissa Marie Alexis Francois, and I hold the position of Executive Director at the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. It is my honor to stand here as your moderator today. Birthed in 1995, the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago was created as a distinct but integral part of the judiciary. The organization is focused on the design and delivery of continuous judicial education, as well as professional development programs for judges, judicial officers, and court staff, with the aim of supporting the judiciary's mandate of corporate excellence, the sustenance of public trust and confidence, and the administration and achievement of justice. In 2019, Members of the Board of the Judicial Education Institute had the wonderful opportunity to meet with academics of the Faculty of Social Sciences to discuss a proposed court training initiative that would focus on forensic social work. Little did any of us know that this would be the starting point of a formal educational partnership with the Faculty of Social Sciences. Today, the Honorable Justice Lucky, Justice of Appeal, will kick off the first and very timely lecture under this agreement, and it's supposed to last for about three years. So judge, we have three years of these lectures to go. As the Caribbean poet articulated, now is the time to stand, counteract, and unite. Now is the time for us to speak up. This is precisely what both of our organizations will be doing this evening. I am privileged to introduce to you Dr. Cola Lewis Cameron, who will deliver opening remarks. Dr. Lewis Cameron is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, 
She is an educator with over 20 years of experience in higher education. Dr. Lewis Cameron is the lead editor of the text, Marketing Island Destinations, Concepts and Cases, and Managing Crises in Tourism, Resilience Strategies from the Caribbean. Dr. Lewis Cameron is also co-author of the textbook, Caribbean Tourism Concepts and Cases. Let us warmly welcome her as she comes to deliver opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to warmly welcome you to the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus. And permit me to make special mention with us this evening and thank the Honorable the Chief Justice, Mr. Justice Ivo Archie, ORTT, Chief Justice of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and President of the Judicial Education Institute. I also want to to recognize our feature speaker for this evening, the Honorable Justice Julian Lucky, Justice of Appeal, Appeal Court of the Ju Judiciary of Trinidad and Tobago, and also Chairman of the Judicial Education Institute. I want to also welcome our colleague, Mrs. Suklal, Minister of Government, and welcome as well the number of judges that we have present here this evening other distinguished guests, my colleagues from the University of the West Indies. Good evening. I wanted to first of all bring greetings on behalf of my principal, Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine, who is unable to be with us this evening, but she sends her best wishes. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2019 UN Global Study on Homicide indicates that Trinidad and Tobago has the 10th highest murder rate in the world. With 450 murders committed in 2021, the murder rate for Trinidad and Tobago stood at 32.4%, 32.4 per 100,000 inhabitants. For this year, over 500 murders have already been committed, suggesting that 2022 may be a record-breaking year. Reports of wounding and shooting are also on the rise. This is not surprising since approximately 75% of murders are committed with firearms. Despite this, other crimes such as burglaries and robberies have been on the decline within the more recent times, though the number of crimes on the whole being committed certainly is still quite large. Dealing effectively with the crime situation requires a whole of government and whole of society approach, where equal emphasis is placed on crime prevention and crime suppression. The criminal justice system plays an integral role in the fight against crime, with each arm responsible for different but equally important functions. This system is under considerable strain as a result of the very large number of offenses being committed. Now, more than ever, is the need for strengthening of that system with deeper and wider coordination required among stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I refer here to the intelligence community, regional entities, universities, the court system, the police, the prison, and other agencies which work to ensure safety and security. Given this context, ladies and gentlemen, this public lecture appropriately titled Is Justice Elusive? A perspective from the criminal justice system is certainly relevant as well as timely. This evening's event is, is very much a key milestone for the Faculty of Social Sciences as we continue to execute our vision of being socially engaged and solutions oriented. It also represents, as you would have heard from the, the chair, a series of interactions between the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Judicial Education Institute, which has culminated in this inaugural lecture today. On May the 25th, 
of this year, the Faculty of Social Sciences and the JEI signed a MOU signaling our commitment to work as partners to engage in professional development programs for the benefits of for the benefits of not only judges and judicial officers, senior court administrators, but also students and the general public. And so our discussion on the criminal justice system this evening is but one of several areas to be explored by our judicial partners. And we are very fortunate that our students, our staff, and our distinguished guests have the pleasure of engaging in meaningful discourse with the judi judiciary on areas of critical importance to our society. As I close, let me take this opportunity again to thank the Honorable Chief Justice for championing this initiative. Thank you also to Justice Lucky for her commitment to this partnership, demonstrated by her very enthusiastic response when she was asked to, to be the feature presenter today. I want to thank also Dr. Francois and her team at the JEI, as well as Dr. Esnard and her team from the Department of Behavioral Sciences for giving this initiative legs and getting us to this point today. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of this evening's proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. It is truly an honor to introduce our speaker this evening. The Honorable Justice Lucky, Justice of Appeal, and Chairman of the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. One of the daunting aspects of being tasked with such a mammoth responsibility is ensuring that your delivery includes the professional accomplishments of the speaker. However, there must be illumination into the person's essence, their core principles and values. I hope that I can achieve both this afternoon or this evening. Whether you are here today as a student, judicial colleague, attorney at law, friend, or member of the public, there are some significant effective merits of today's speaker that we can collectively agree upon. Team JEITT describes Justice Lucky as the effervescent energizer bunny who keeps going and going and going. Can we agree? Okay, fantastic. Students describe Justice Lucky as a true educator who cares about their future and well-being. Justice Lucky is also an avid Star Wars fan. Can we agree? Fantastic. Citizens describe Justice Lucky as a down-to-earth judge who they can approach and sometimes ask for legal advice at the supermarket or church and judge is always willing to give a good word of encouragement and contribute to a worthy cause. We can agree to that, right? Colleagues, friends, and family have described Justice Lucky as a true justice warrior and a patriot who always puts country first. And yes, we can agree to that. In addition to these intangibles, Several noteworthy accomplishments in Justice Lucky's professional life have also played a very key role in today's positioning on this very powerful platform. The judge joined the judiciary of Trinidad and Tobago as a high court judge for the 2009 to 2010 period and then again in 2014. During 2010 to 2014, Justice Lucky held the post of director of the Police Complaints Authority. Having been called to the bar in 1991, the earlier parts of Justice Lucky's career reflect public service in positions of senior state counsel in the office of the DPP, minister in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs in 2001, opposition member of parliament from 2002 to 2007, and member of the Crime and Justice Commission from 2007 to 2009. While lecturing at the UWE in the early 1990s, Justice Lucky was responsible for implementing the long distance learning program for the elements of commercial law course. This enabled participants in the region to enroll in the program. 
Furthermore, Justice Lucky was also a columnist and host of the TV program, I don't know if you all remember it, Just Jill, and principal of the Academy of Tertiary Studies. In addition to these accomplishments, Justice Lucky completed a certified program in countering transnational organized crime at the George Marshall Center in Germany in 2018. Justice Lucky has contributed extensively to the work of judicial education by conducting workshops in the OECS, Guyana, Barbados, Belize, and throughout the Commonwealth. Some of the areas of focus have been the admissibility of digital evidence, effective case management, principles and methodologies in sentencing, gang and terrorist prosecutions, judge alone trials, maximum sentencing hearings, criminal procedure rules, just to name a few. Justice Lucky is also a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, UE, and the Hugh Wedding Law School. Justice Lucky's passion for education over the years led to the appointment as chair of the Judicial Education Institute of Trinidad and Tobago in January 2019. I ask that we all stand and welcome to the stage the Honorable Justice Gillian Lucky, Justice of Appeal, to deliver on the topic, Is Justice Elusive? Thank you very much to the moderator, Dr. Carissa Marie Alexis Francois, Executive Director of the JEITT. And let me begin, Chief Justice. Usually it would be I standing to you, so let me just give you the bow so that all protocols are deemed to be in order. For all of you who answered yes to what the moderator asked when she gave her glowing tributes, which just have me now more nervous and under more pressure, um, your reward would be one of those books, I stress, one of those books, free of charge. Of course, if you were one of the louder voices, check me after, you'll get two, because that would be the justice of the case. The Honorable, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Justice Ivor Archie, Order of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and President of the JEITT, Minister in the Ministry of the Attorney General and Legal Affairs, Senator, the Honorable Mrs. Renuka Sagram Singh Soklal, members of the board of the JEITT, judges and judicial officers of the Judiciary of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Kola Cameron Lewis, Dr. Camille Samuel, Dr. Talia Esnard, who has now boasted me because of the number of phone calls she received directly and indirectly, acting commissioners of police and commissioner of prisons, and members of your rank and file, representatives of the legal fraternity, representatives of court administration of the judiciary, judicial research council who provide great support to all judicial officers. Can we give them a round of applause? They are here in their numbers. Distinguished members of the audience, and of course, students of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, students of the Hugh Wedding Law School, and students of all tertiary institutions. Can we give them a loud round of applause because this is really for them. I begin by thanking each and every one of you for coming here this afternoon. When I saw the weather this morning, I thought, okay, I'm going to get at least 20 calls asking whether this event is canceled. I didn't get 20, I got 42, not that I was counting. I too was very worried, and for those of you who know me, to ensure that I was here, and there is evidence, for those of you from my evidence class, there is evidence that I was on campus from 1 p.m. this afternoon. I want to say a special thank you to the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Dr. Timothy Afonso, and his team, who allowed me without paying any rent, prime real estate in the faculty, and I thank you very much. I left the office clean, and I did wash that cup with the coffee in it. <laughs> There are some of you who may think, well, listen, you know, we know Jillian, and we know Jillian likes to deliver something that has the level of humor in it. But perhaps this afternoon, you would see, in this evening, you would see me wearing a different hat. Justice is something I feel very passionate about. It is something that I have always fought for, and that is why I love Star Wars. And just to show you that I would try to do as much justice as I can, even if you look at the flyer and you look at me this evening, you will see it's the same jacket. My new has been dry cleaned, and I tried even to look the same, so that at the end of the day, what you see is what you get. I am passionate about justice, 
because at the end of the day, that is what we all call for, not so? We all want justice. Have you not used that phrase sometime in your life? I want justice. For those of you who didn't use it, there's another class, 101 in the engineering building, and you all are free to go to that engineering class. Or I could call on the Chief Justice, who himself is an engineer, and he could probably conduct that class for you. The simple point I make is this. We are asking ourselves a question this afternoon, this evening, which I am not going to just give a spin on. You didn't come here this evening and braving the weather. And for those of you who have to go back to South, I'm not saying that South is the best place in Trinidad. I'm just saying I am from South. Carney River is at 94%. But don't worry, I'll keep you all informed because there's somebody keeping me informed all the time. And putting Jillian, don't get nervous. But the fact is, you came here this evening and you came here to hear truth, not so? You didn't come here for me to spin numbers. You didn't come here for me to tell you all the initiatives that we are doing in the judiciary, and we are. You came here to get a reality check, correct? Because if you didn't come here for a reality check, again, let me know, and I don't know where I'll send you this time. And that is why I ask you quite openly, and I want you to be honest. It is, this session is being recorded, but they'll be seeing the back of you. So nobody will be able to put a face to where you voted. How many of you are of the view that justice is elusive? Just raise your hands. Be honest, even if you are judges, even though we as judges carry the title justice, and I am here so I'm not elusive, raise your hand if you are of the view that justice is elusive. How many of you are of the view that justice is not elusive? And clearly we have many people who are under 18 because they cannot vote. Okay, so you all are looking really well and I mean, all of you all are under 18, and that's why you couldn't vote, and I fully understand. The fact is, we are all present this evening because the subject of justice and the ability of the individual to access it and benefit from it must be something that attracts our interest and deserves our attention. If we look at the next slide, and I looked for this image, and it is an image available free on the internet, so no copyright. What are your thoughts? And I just asked you, and many of you said it was elusive. And when I look at this lady justice, the reason I particularly like this representation is that one, the blindfold is removed. And for years I have said it is time to remove the blindfold. I know what the underpinnings of the blindfold mean. It means that justice is fair. That when you become before justice, justice is to see where you come from or how much money you have. But I also think the time has come for justice to take a look at what is happening. Because when she looks at what is happening, my view is that if we could use the Trimbegonian way, if you had to put, you know, a little blurb to it, my blurb will be, oh my God, what's going on? What happened since last I had this blindfold on? Would you agree with me? Because justice knows all that she's doing. Or if we can say all that they are doing. Let's not be gender specific. And my view is, justice is not elusive. Justice is there, and that is, the, that is the position I am taking this evening. I have not taken the easier one, which many of you would have agreed with, is justice elusive, yes it is. I have taken deliberately the harder side, because, not because it's the harder side, it is because the side, it is the side that I believe in. And what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to take another vote, and when we take the other vote, you tell me whether you vote the same or not, Justice Pemberton, I know the way you voted. And as I said, we don't have a best dress prize this evening, but you can feel free to take as many books as you would like, as many of the books that you would like. But I'm going to look at all of you who voted in a particular way. And if at the end of it you vote the same way, it just means I have failed. And when I fail, I cry. And when I cry, I get depressed. Okay, so what are your thoughts? And that's where I asked you the specific question. Many of you may be thinking, well, to determine about justice and whether it's elusive, I've said before what my position is, that justice is not elusive. You might be saying, well, Jillian, why did you choose this time? Because what do we have happening right now in our country? Well, before we even go to what's happening in the country, let me just do what I know that all students would appreciate. Because students, you recognize this is really for you, correct? All students, give yourselves a round of applause. All students from Faculty of Law or Hugh Wooding Law School who came here expecting hints, um, especially Faculty of Law. Faculty of Law students, you all didn't come here expecting hints for the Q&A next week, right? 
or for the exam? You all did? Okay. Just remember this is recorded. I cannot give you all any hints. So what we're going to look at is who comprises the criminal justice system? What makes justice seem, deliberately using that word, seem elusive? And what can be done to enhance justice? So this isn't saying that justice is elusive. It is just saying, I don't know how many of you believe in this, but I always believe there is more that can be done. Many of you believe that there is always more that can be done. So, Gillian Lucky decided, because I chose this topic, and I decided to come and convince you that justice is not elusive, and these are the headlines you're seeing. Not so? Those headlines in the papers, to me, raise immediately, where's the justice? Which crazy person would come here to try at a time like this to convince you that justice is not elusive? The person isn't crazy, they're just lucky. <laughs> For all of you who are laughing at the jokes, free books at the end. Sorry, free one book at the end. And not to embarrass anyone, because let me make it very clear this evening. We're not pointing fingers, and we're not laying the blame at the feet of any one institution or agency, because that is half the problem. Half the problem is we're pointing. What we're doing is we're working as a team. But I will tell, tell you something. Society getting a good buff at the end of my lecture this afternoon, because I see at the end, society has to ask itself, as Janet Jackson asked us, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, what have you done for justice lately? So, you all know who Janet Jackson is. <laughs> you know what I laugh at? I ask who Janet Jackson is, and this is what the young people in the audience, I know you all are, you all in the middle section. I tell you all, good place to choose. The older ones took care, they can handle these steps, right? <laughs> and when I say that, Janet Jackson, they're looking at me, uh-huh. The younger people right here knew it, and some wanted to perform it. We'll do that just now, okay? But let's look and see what we're dealing with. It's not to embarrass us to see what we're dealing with. And what we're dealing with, reality check, is that this is comparing 2021 and 2022, okay? Serious crimes, 9361. 2022, we are 10,344. Murders, we have plus 46%. We have larceny of motor vehicles, plus 165%. And narcotic offenses, plus 245%. So you might be going, wow, oh gosh, what are we going to do? At the end of this lecture, we, you know, justice is not elusive. We know what we have to do, you know. We just have to keep doing it. And that's why I said, keep with me because I'm giving the reality checks. Notice I have not doctored any numbers there for you. And let's go now to what is justice. And I'll tell you why it's important that we have to define it. Because when we, when we talk about justice, for some people, justice means fairness, others equality, and for many who view it from the criminal justice sector, it means having one's day in court. And according to the Britannica Dictionary, justice is, as the, is the process or result of using laws to fairly judge and punish crimes and criminals. And I'll tell you why I have a concern, greatest respect, to those from who have given that definition of justice. You realize immediately, using that Britannica definition, justice is limited to what's happening in the courtroom. And therein lies the problem. And Chief Justice, that's why we always get the blame, because that's what it is. It's what's happening in the courtroom. So everything before, and Acting Commissioner, you get in blame too, because their point of view is to get to the courtroom, the only track is through the TTPS. So you get in the blame, the courts get in the blame, and the commissioner of prisons here, prison rep commissioner of prisons. Sir, very nice to meet you. We haven't met formally yet. Bounce. And sir, with the greatest respect, many people even forget in the role prisons play. But I'll tell you one thing, Julian Lucky has never forgotten. And for every kind of training I have done, I have asked, where are the prison representatives? Because this concept of from bail to jail just forgets those who are also playing critical roles. And so this evening, I say a round of applause to our prison service, please, because of the role they play. So when you define justice as what is happening in the courtroom, you immediately have an indictment against us. And more importantly, you immediately make the elusiveness of justice something that is a no-brainer to answer and say, well, yes, it's elusive. Because it's all based on outcomes, and let's face it, if the police and law enforcement don't get cases to the courtrooms 
And if the courtrooms don't determine those cases in a timely fashion, well, then that's the end of it. There's no justice. And what I am submitting respectfully this afternoon, this evening, is that to use such a myopic definition of justice is to be unfair to justice itself and also to leave out very important players in this criminal justice sector. So what I have done, not for my purposes, but certainly to put forward what my definition is of justice. Justice is the fairest outcome when due process has been followed. Justice calls on each individual to act with honesty, decency, and compassion, and to demand the same from all institutions. What do you all think of that definition? You like it? You don't like it? You want to take it as your own? You can have it. But think about it. That is what justice is. And I want to thank those who helped me to formulate it. In fact, I spoke to our CEA or the judiciary, Master Morris Allen. And when I said to her, look, well, this is what I think justice means and what justice means to me, she asked me to include the decency part of it. Because many times we are forgetting this. We're talking about honesty and compassion. We're forgetting the decency that comes with fairness. Decency meaning how you treat people. Decency meaning the respect. In my days, acting commissioner, when we saw a police officer, I used, to, I used to stand and pay attention. All of that is what we're losing. And that's why I'm saying society will get a buff. But my buffs aren't bad buffs, don't worry. Because I'm a part of society too. So I found the reception that I got from a definition. I know some of you have a better thing. But do you understand why it has to go wide and it should be wide? Because if you use Britannica, no disrespect to the people, you will get it only happening in the court. And I'll tell you why that's not correct. What about the victim of a crime whose matter never gets to court because nobody is charged? Then you'll be saying they never get justice. And I am arguing before you that there are things that can be done to help those persons. And if anything I say is fitting into what is happening in society right now, I beg you, please, I have not come here to embarrass anyone, politically or otherwise. I'm just dealing with reality. So what I'm saying is, if little children are on the ground and they're hearing gunshots, Nobody may be charged for it, but at the end of the day, they are still traumatized. What about the victim? And many of you are from the office of the DPP. We will, how many former prosecutors we have here? Okay, some of you were still wondering if you were, okay? <laughs> right. How many times when we prosecuted, based on due process, due process, there were not guilty verdicts? Do you remember how your victims felt? Do you remember them telling us they didn't get justice? You remember already in, in rape cases, especially, they'll say, I don't know why I bother to even come forward. What did we promise them? Not justice. And what did they see as justice? They saw a guilty verdict. But we didn't explain to them. And I, I should say we didn't. I'm sure we did. I'll convert it, because I, I know we did. Because, Carl, I remember coming to you when I did my first. You may not remember, because for you, that was just 10 years ago. For me, it was 30 years ago. And I remember coming to you because this victim had said she didn't want to give any evidence. You were senior to me, and you said to me, you said, you know, don't use, don't focus on the verdict. Tell her and explain to her that even for herself, let her go through the due process. And even if she gets not guilty, she would know at the end of the day she did her best. Of course, we add on to that, if the person is guilty, you prevent others from, you know, succumbing to what she had to succumb to and so. But understand what justice meant, and that is why I go back and say to you, you cannot use justice as the outcome in the courtroom. Because if you keep using it, then you're going to get people involved in a numbers game. And then you'll have prosecutors wanting more to persecute and prosecute. No disrespect to the office of the DPP. I'm just saying, because people will then value how good or bad you are based on your number of convictions. And that's why I've used it. So for those of you who answer kind of like, yeah, because you know in Trinidad and Tobago, when you offer somebody something, like I've offered you this, people tend to think, I wonder if I could do better. Man, I have something that better, you know. And then, let me, how many of you understand now why I've used this definition? All right, for you clapping, two books. I would go with the purple and the red. Purple and the red. And the next thing is, what does elusive mean? Well, this was easier. Elusive means difficult to find, catch, or achieve. So let's put it together. The proposition is, is justice elusive? And this is where the scientists and me will come out now. Is justice elusive? I've defined justice. And I am saying justice is not elusive because it's not difficult to find, it's not difficult to catch, and it's not difficult to achieve. I'm not going to take the vote now 
for those of you who want to change, all right? There's still more to come. So at the end of the day, I just want, as I said before, to tell you the framework within which I am operating. I've given you the definition of justice, and I have said to you what I consider to be um, very correct in terms of what this definition is. Difficult to find, catch, or achieve. And I am saying, if we put it together, is justice elusive? I am saying it is not elusive, because as we go through this evening, we will see what is happening, and I'll be sharing with you case scenarios, and I will be asking you to be the judge. You be the judge, and you tell me whether justice was served or not served. My approach to the proposition is very simple. One, to show that we have all the parts of a justice system in which the public can repose trust and confidence, my view is that's not difficult. Two, to get all the parts to work in tandem through sustained communication, collaboration, and cohesion amongst the players in the criminal justice system. I am saying that is also not difficult. Three, to get this audience to believe me when I say that justice is not elusive, that is going to be difficult. So I am pressing on. And pressing on means, for those who would still believe that's elusive, let's ask ourselves the hard question. And the hard question is this, what makes justice appear elusive? I see some of you smiling because you notice I'm not caving in. I use the word appear. You thought Jillian would have put what makes justice elusive and you would have used slide number 32 against me. Oh, slide number 32 is not 32. Yes, it's slide 32. No, 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 no. I went through this three or four times. Give a round of applause to all who helped me, please. Yeah. My, my, my secretary who is in Maruga and she put it together. I have GROCs who helped me, Shakari Gordon. I have people, I went into Massey stores and places getting things. And I want to say this is a collaborative um, effort in which we had a lot of communication. And I can assure you at the end of it, well, you'll we tell us if we had the cohesion. So what makes justice appear elusive? Language barriers. Let's face it, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a population of about 1.4 million, but we have many people coming before the courts. English is not their first language. And it isn't that you have a person who is in the court who automatically speaks, whether it's Mandarin or Spanish or any other language. And I'm not limiting because we have all these people who come before us. And I'm not saying it's, it's anybody's fault. I'm just saying these are realities. Imagine if this evening I was... So That's no language, by the way. So if you understood it, something is very wrong. Right? The only language I really understand well is Minion. How many of you, the Minions are really good. I understand that whole thing. They don't speak. So think of language barriers. You're standing, already it's intimidating. I mean, we don't realize, but even going to court, listen, once I see those letters, court, I start to shake. Right? You go into court and you don't understand anything the person is saying, but it's all about you. That's what makes it elusive in the beginning. A pair elusive. Unrepresented parties. Imagine you're in a courtroom and you see either the police or the prosecutor or prosecutor from the DPP's office, and you stand in there by yourself like a cheese. What about legal lingo? Actors rear, men's rear, faculty of law students. You all know that, right? Yeah. It come in any multiple choice. <laughs> poverty. And we have to understand, poverty is a real thing, you know. And many people believe that it's not about justice is how much money you have. If you're rich, you'll be able to beat the system. If you're rich, you can afford the best lawyers. It's not about justice really determines who has the better lawyer. That's what people believe. Unexplained sentences, that has nothing to do with grammar. What I mean is sentences in terms of sentences we impose in the courts. Headlines such as, murderer gets two years. And I know we have members of the media, and again, this is not bashing anybody, but when the headline is murderer gets two years, in Trinidad and Tobago, I'm sorry to say it, people don't read the whole article. And they don't understand that this person who was charged with murder was actually somebody who benefited from the felony murder rule. Yeah, one student's felony murder rule. <laughs> Joint enterprise. And in felony murder rule, I just love you all, you know. <laughs> and in the felony murder rule, so they benefit from, they can come before the courts. The judicial officer might have imposed 30 years. They pleaded guilty, that's usually one third, it goes to 20 years. They might have been in jail, we'll come to that just now, 17 years, they left with three years. 
And then maybe for good behavior, what they did, plea mitigation, it goes on to two years. Headline, murderer gets two years. Social media, get rid of the chief justice, get rid of justice fucking, get rid of everybody, blow up everything, vigilante justice, look at that, a murderer, a murderer. You know how I felt today when Shakari showed me an article on social media, they have the judge, I don't want to cause further embarrassment. He adjudicated in a sexual offense case. They put a picture of the judge. You know, social media began saying that that is the accused. That is the person. Yes. Yes. Lisa, that's what we're facing as judges. And not all of us look as beautiful as you. You see the kind of pictures the media put of me? You see the kind of pictures the media put of me? That in itself, I think, is a travesty. But anyway, I move forward. The point I'm making is people not even taking the time to read that that was the judge in the case. She can't remember you showed it to me today? That was a judge in the case. So I'm just showing you, we're not even taking any time in society to understand. And I could tell you, judicial officers are explaining it. We go at pains to say, this is where we start, this is what we do, this is how we reach. A headline like that, okay, even judicial officers, I'm asking you this, judicial officers, if you read a headline like that as a citizen, murderer, walks free or murderer gets a year, wouldn't that really make you feel that there's no justice? How a murderer could get one year when people who are with narcotics get in 12 and 14? And that's why I say it is the unexplained sentences. Not that we're not explaining, but I don't know what our budget is like if we can have our own newspaper, sir. I'm not sure. Okay. I know you've been asking for our own, um, you know, to control our own finances, but we could have something in our newspaper. Um, just something to think about. Um, age, age, and this is important, eh? youth and elders, it's how we treat the vulnerable in our society. Older people, some of them not understanding even technology. They're willing to learn, but they're not understanding. Younger people who don't understand process. People with mental challenges, you know, growing up, oh God, I wasn't crazy, and you laugh at them. No, mental challenges are real things. Mental wellness. People who are victims of abuse. Victims of abuse start off saying there's no justice. That has nothing to do with us in the courtroom, you know. They start off by saying they're victims because of where they may come from, what happened to them, nobody did anything. A lack of education. A lack of education meaning nobody's fault, but they don't have the access. For those of you in university, I want to tell you something. Don't take your education for granted. Eh? And don't think your access for granted. I know many of you have challenges. But don't take it for granted. Because with all the challenges you have, there are people who can't even step foot in this campus. Do you know how many young people don't even know about this campus? They don't have the money to get a car to come and see. And even if they were to allow to come, and I mean if they could come, they would be in awe. I've, 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 I've walked on the campus of the university. Geography. Look at what happened today. Some people could not come this evening to this lecture because of the geography where they live. Many of them wanted to come. Think of perhaps when you have court. Think of when you're living in Cedrus and you have to go to a high court in Port of Spain or San Fernando or in Tobago. Think of your geography. Think of where you also come from, where sometimes there are just things that you just, you know, people take for granted. Yes, you could come here. And that's why in the courtrooms, I could tell you we are trained because we get trained. We judicial officers are human beings, we get trained. And I remember, Justice Pemberton, you conducted something where we talked about understanding and the whole thing about implicit bias and so. And don't presume that when somebody comes in a courtroom not looking the way you think they should look, it's because they're disrespectful. It may be the best they have. The busted shoe, that might be the best that they have. Then we have court experiences. Some people, because of a bad court experience, they have nothing good to say about any court. Think of any private enterprise you go to, and when you go to it, you get a bad experience, that's it for you. Intersectionality, and that really is something that Dr. Francois shared with me in terms of many of these other things interplay. So it may be your geography, and that has led to the poverty, and that has led to many things. And I'll tell you this, a lack of understanding of the legal process. Somebody gets charged, and the first thing is, I know, them are going to go to no court, or when they go to court, you go see what's going to happen. People don't understand there's a process before you even reach out. It's the courts. Do people know in the high court, before we could start a matter, we have to have something before it's called an indictment? Because if we do anything else, they'll bring a constitutional action against us. Okay, and they'll ask us what, where and how are we doing for our case. So even if we have the best interest at heart, we still also have to work within the confines of the law. 
And now let's go to the composition of the criminal justice sector. And there's something that I learned from very early. When you start itemizing, you run a real risk of leaving a group out. So lucky cover that. Students, tell me if I did well here. I put society. I put society. And students, to show you all how important I think you all are, you will notice that I also put academic institutions and not leaving you all out. Because many times when we're doing this criminal justice sector, we forget an important people. And David West, I didn't leave out the PCA. And it's not because I was the former director and I'm promoting anything, because you all are playing a role also. Defense force persons like Michael, I want you to know, I put all of this under law enforcement. And I know you could get technical and tell me that the police are about enforcing the laws and the defense forces. They, I just put everybody under law enforcement because the pie was getting to be a lot. In fact, when, I, when, when Brenda did this, I felt like eating pizza. You know? But, I, but notice what we've started. Chief Justice and members of the judiciary, notice what I put for us. Judicial officers and what? Court administration. Judiciary is not just judicial officers. We could all sit in a court, court rise, we sit, and if we don't have the support of our court administration, and I'm talking about everybody, not the judicial officers, everybody else in that category, we would not get anywhere. So I want a round of applause for the court administration. So that in itself is a paradigm change. So you'll see here that I, I put, I really try to include everybody. So students are you like that, society, right? Please, when you're answering my questions, don't give me any sweep up answer, please. You know, right? You be specific. And then I want to go now to some case studies because I felt this would be important for us. I don't know, how many of you look at Blue Bloods? Mm -hmm. Students, how will you get in time to watch that on a Friday night? Because with the one hour going back, what are you supposed to be studying? So how many of you, I just want to eye there. No spoiler alerts. Okay, good. But those of you, and how many of you saw Blue Bloods last Friday? Oh, how are you going? Okay, right. In Blue Bloods last Friday, no spoiler alert. Commissioner Frank Reagan, many of you may know the actor who plays Tom Selleck from Magna P.I. I don't look at it for the actors. I look at it to see how they're dealing with things. And in it, the issue was whether in fact there should be a disbanding of a particular department that they had, a special force, so to speak. And there were persons who were literally accosting former commissioners when they were at dinner and so on, saying, get rid of it, get rid of it. And, uh, and you're asking them questions. What do you call the new thing happening now? A mob comes to start asking you questions. And what the commissioner had to ask himself was, you know, does he disband or not? But he made a very poignant statement. He was telling his father, who was a former commissioner, that's the whole thing with the blue bloods, so that's a little downside to that show, but anyway, I move on. Start getting accustomed to East New York, that's the show replacing blue bloods. Don't say I say, but you know my Hollywood insiders. And what he said was this. He was telling his father, you will always hear and get the groups that will tell you what wrong that special department did but you would never get the people who benefited from their work coming forward. And I want to tell you, I could speak for me, the other judicial officers here, the chief justice said, but I'm telling you, me, and if anybody else feels this way, you all could say it. We do so much, and sometimes I feel no matter how much we do, I know the expectation is always to do more, but I want if people understand the kind of work that we are doing. And I'm gonna ask you to give our judicial officers a round of applause, all of them. So let's look if I might, at this case study, all these things really happened. A 54-year-old man was charged with sacrilege for stealing $11 from a temple. The man, okay, now, this is a case that has to go to the high court. It's sacrilege. It's not going to be heard in the magistrate's court. So it has to go to the high court. The man was granted 30,000 bail at the magistrate's court. Okay, so I will agree, problem number one, the first thing you'll want to say is that, you know what, the court got it wrong. Because if a man is stealing $11, it's very unlikely that he has $30,000 for bail. The system of bail at the time was also, we tell, and this is what I mean by when we're talking about justice. I want to stop and pause for a course and tell you how I, because this is something that I know we in the courts, we addressed. Back in the day, when you wanted bail, and I see we have defense attorneys, Mr. Rajkumar, you are here, back in the day, Bail was something that really could only be given to people realistically in terms of them raising it if they had property. So university students, unless you all have property that I don't know about, you're going to be in trouble. All right? So we tell people on one hand, don't go to professional bailers. Those are the people who will produce the deed. 
You'll use their deed, but you have to give them money. So we tell them, don't go to professional bailers. But if you don't have property, how you get in the bail? So I am saying it's easy to point your finger here and say, well, look, you see, it's bad stress, but I should get it wrong. Well, I'm going to come and defend them and say something. That particular person, we call them the drug addict, not to be rude, but just to put in a scenario, was unrepresented. They, I'm sure there were lawyers at the bar table who could have stood up and assisted them. Mr. Rajkumar, you have done that many times. Could have said, listen, you know, I just want to take some quick instructions. That unrepresented person didn't use a channel, and I'm not blaming them, I'm just saying there's a channel where if you feel that the bail was set too high, could have gone to a high court to review it. Wasn't done. So I'm just saying, notice a lot of things happening. The fact that this person is stealing, it wasn't his first time, it means that no rehabilitation, he's just committing a crime all the time. So society, see what role you were supposed to play and you didn't. Three and a half years later, during a status hearing, and I'll explain that, a status hearing at the High Court, the court realized that the man was committed to stand trial, but the indictment had not yet been filed. And I want to pause for a cause here. Chief Justice is right here. When we recognized in the courts what was happening, that persons are in remand, and remand means that they, for example, can't raise bail or they committed to stand trial in the high court. What had happened here is that there was no indictment, and we recognized there were many people in that position. Many people meaning they wanted to know what was going on, they wanted to plead guilty, but we can't do anything until we get an indictment. One of the initiatives, when we went to Chief Justice, Chief Justice said, listen, we said, what about a status hearing? In other words, you are in remand, your indictment is not filed, so you can't come to the high court. But what if we, through the prisons, ask them, not to force anybody, it's not about pleading guilty, but just ask them, send out something, because you all have your communications in there. Do you want to come before the court and ask what is happening about your matter, so we'll know what the situation is. Chief Justice, you will remember I came to you very concerned because a letter was sent saying we were being unconstitutional and that people will challenge us in court. Chief Justice, you remember, that night I called you at around 11.42 p.m., not that I remember. And I said to you, Chief Justice, we're going to start this tomorrow. Chief, these are true, so you'll remember. And I will remember the words of the Chief Justice, as it is this. Jillian, are you sure what you're doing is fair? Yes, sir. Are you sure it is in the name of justice? Yes, sir. And Chief Justice said, well, let people say that what the court is doing is wrong in trying to find out what people want to do, because we don't have it before us. And with that, I went forward. We have Justice Bansi Sukai here former registrar, and what the registrar and marshal of the Supreme Court, and what we did internally, working, so you were not yet the commissioner, but we worked with former commissioners, and what we said is, look, ask your personnel, not, you're not telling people if you want to plead guilty, you know, you're just giving them the opportunity to come and ask what is happening with their indictment or where it is, so we in the court could work out, is it us taking too long to produce the documents from the magistrate's court to come to the high court? Or is there some other challenge? So said, so done. We had status hearings. And in those status hearings, accused would say, look, I want to plead guilty. Or they might say, look, I don't want to plead guilty, but I'm waiting 10 years from a matter. And we began then working out what we could do. So we were chipping away. But you understand the level of cooperation, collaboration, so that we would know what was taking place. Anyway, getting back to this gentleman, at the instruction of the court, the indictment was fast track and filed. I want to recognize Master Jones. He was then a prosecutor. And it was him as prosecutor who went back and said, listen, let's see how we can get matters fast tracked. When the, we got the indictment, the drug addict pleaded guilty. In mitigation, the man admitted that he had a drug ad addiction and he had committed many similar offenses. He had been in jail, as I said, for three and a half years. He was sentenced and time was considered served, meaning that he had already spent three and a half years. The court made arrangements for the accused to come back to the court for a post-sentencing update. However, the accused never returned to the court. And I need to pause for a cause here and tell you all why this is important. Again, we are told, when you're a judicial officer, when you're sentenced, that is it. You've done your job. How can you do your job when you know that you're sending somebody outside? So time served may be happy for many people. You know what that accused told me? Judge, I have nobody to come for me today, you know. You think you could put off the sentence? And judge, I don't have anywhere to go and live now, you know. You think you could get somebody for me? And we as judges are, you know people like to use this F word called functus. Please make sure in the recording that you all don't cut it in the wrong place, eh? F word called functus. Where they tell us our job is done. Let me tell you something, when you're a judicial officer, 
I am telling you, your job is never done. Because you always want to make sure you got it right, that you did not do a disservice to anybody, and you're always churning things through. Anyway, he never came back before the court, and I really don't know what happened to him. And the reason I wanted him to come back to the court is to see what services I could have offered, but he didn't come back. And I ask you now, you are the judge, was there justice in that case? It's hard to say, exactly. So your hand from being all the way up is kind of reaching here. But would you say, judge, that we went all out to do what we could do? And justice was served in terms of we really went over and above whatever damage control we had to do. So was justice elusive? You're beginning to think about that? No, your hand's folded. So from in the air, it folded. I take in a fold. I, you know, have to know when to fold them, when to hold them. And I'm saying, is it, I can't give back the man three and a half years, but I could do my best to make sure that I am there for him to give justice. Another one, the foreigner. Foreigner was a national of Estonia. Police officers approached the foreigner and informed him that he was a suspect in a plan to traffic cocaine. The foreigner confessed and told the officers that he and another man agreed to ingest a quantity of cocaine to be trafficked to England. The foreigner assisted the police officers with a sting operation to capture the other man. The other man was eventually caught and both men were charged in February 2013. They were trying to get the other man but, but also the big fish. They never got the big fish. The other man had ingested 774 grams of cocaine and that is a little above one um, pound of cocaine. He was charged pursuant to the Dangerous Drugs Act with trafficking cocaine. That other man pleaded guilty at the magistrate's court. He was sentenced to four years imprisonment. He got a remitted um, sentence. Usually one year if you behave well, one jail year is eight months. That is no reason to say you want to go to jail, but I'm just saying that's how his sentence was reduced. And he was deported to Estonia. Now this is the man who actually ingested it and look what he got, okay? Let's see what happened to the foreigner. The foreigner never ingested any drugs, but he was charged with conspiracy to traffic. He wanted to plead guilty, but it's a common law offense. And therefore, it has to be heard in the high court. So whereas he helped the police and he did everything with his thing operation, the friend is serving time. He's begging to serve time. He, he pleads guilty. They do a paper committal. But it never reached up to the high court. He first comes before the high court in 2017. This happened in 2013. Now, I'll tell you, it wasn't our fault. But we're not here to, to blame. But we have to make sure justice is served because if you're saying justice is elusive you realize we could put the fault someone say i can't do nothing it's not my fault that's why it's not elusive because you have to always ask yourself what can you do and what we did was this mr rajkumar you would remember this case well mr rajkumar filed a bail application knowing that his client would not get bail it was his client i use this just to corroborate faculty of law and he law school corroboration and mr rajkumar brought forward a bail application and in it said to the court, look, I know the court will not grant bail, but could the court understand that my client wants to plead guilty? The, co the co-conspirator, the person who actually committed the worst part of the crime has, is back in Estonia. And what we did, again, Master Jones was the prosecutor before me. He was able to get the indictment filed. The foreigner pleaded guilty. He was sentenced. The time he had spent covered what would have been the sentence imposed. But it didn't end there. Again, some colleagues, not you, Carla, some colleagues said, Julian, that's the end of the matter. You don't have to take that on now. But let me tell you what happens, and Commissioner, you all will know this, and both commissioners. When you send back to the deportation center, you have to go back to Estonia. The government has to pay for the officers who have to accompany that person to go back. So if the government doesn't have money, then you're waiting there. And we don't have our own budget, and I didn't have money to give, and it would be wrong for a ticket to Estonia. So what we did was, every month, I would have this gentleman coming back before me, every month. And he even invited me to Tallinn, and I said, no, I can't come, that would be so wrong. Um, Mr. Rajkumar said he would go. And every month coming, and what was so good was the immigration department. Now, I notice I don't have them here, but if you're from immigration, you're coming under society and law enforcement. Immigration officer came each time, and he was telling me where it had reached, because he explained that you had to have in all four to six officers going and the Estonian did get back. Was there justice? Was there justice? There was not. You on my side or not? <laughs> That's like the old force player who put on the jack and no even of the pan have his. Oh, I saw have his. And to me, there was justice. Why? Look when it came to us. 
And it's the point I'm making this evening in my submission. It is when the ball comes to you, whenever it comes, early, late, whenever, you don't jump aside and say, I ain't touching that. You have to take the ball and you kick it. I used to be a footballer in my days. You see any moves? Somebody going to write on social media, you know, Lucky was still humorous. And I hope you'll, but you're getting the seriousness of it, right? The reason is I might be going beyond my time and I kind of begging that you wouldn't run me off with music. Every make sure that music not playing, eh? right? So I'm saying when we got it, that's what it, again, we worked as a team in this, you know. I have to recognize the JSOs who work with us because we can't call people ourselves. But Ms. Rajkumar, you would know the JSO and Annabelle was calling to make sure things were in order. And then we have the bandits. Please don't get upset. I call people the bandits. But hear this one now. July 1999, they commit this robbery. The men escaped, later intercepted. The matter came up for hearing, guess when? 2019. Yep, again, you want to say it's the courts, but this was one there was a combination of matters. And in those days, we were not docketed. So you'll see the interventions coming in that were put in by the Chief Justice, who I say, without reservation, is a visionary leader. And you'll see for yourself when you see that slide. And when it came up for 2019, it came up before me, what do I do then? Carla, we have had this. What do we say? Oh, God, is so long. What are we going to do? Let's give it to somebody else. No, we have to take the bull by the horns. We have to deal with it. And as I'm saying, we have to ensure the justice. These men wanted to plead guilty. Before me now, you have the men wanting to plead guilty, and you have the businessmen. And I always remember, we, we, are, we are trained. You hear the voice of everybody, yeah? So you hear everybody in this case. And the victims indicated that although they forgave the accused, the victims spoke about how it impacted their life. The businessman said he just couldn't, he, he closed shop literally. And it caused the destruction of his finances, his family, everything. And the bandits were ordered to pay 15,000 15, compensation. Both victims got money. And each accused was sentenced to three years hard labor. Again, I want you to understand this is after following the procedure, eh? because you might leave here and say, oh God, they only get three years, it might be worth robbing. No. What I'm saying is we go through the procedure, but this was the challenge that I had. 20 years later, one of the men said, you know, judge, if I had pleaded guilty earlier, and he admitted he had not been saying he wanted to plead guilty, but now he had a family with children, both of them. And they said, judge, the way it works is when we sentence you, your sentence starts from them, so you'll be taken away. And in the Court of Appeal, we see the same thing happening. So I'll tell you what we did. And again, all of this, when it's new, we go to the Chief Justice. So if we get in trouble, he will get in trouble, right? <laughs> You know, like when you go to the parent and you make sure they say it's a sign off. And, and Chief, I remember coming to you with this one because it was really starting something new called delayed sentencing. And Chief again gave the proviso and said, ensure that the prosecutor is comfortable with it because they don't think the person's a flight risk because it won't apply to everybody. Why was this important? If I had sentenced them there and then, they are going to be taken away. Who's explaining to their children? Are we now going to lose another generation? Daddy went to work today, or court today, and never came back home. Mommy or aunt or whoever, who taking care of the children, who driving the children to school? And they asked me if I would give them six months. They wanted to go over Christmas. I said, during that time, call on the family members. See if the wife could get a job. I even asked them, she can remember, I asked them if your wife could cook. I wasn't looking, I said, you know, try and now entrepreneurship skills. Come back in January. In January, when they came back, knowing they what was going to happen to them, because I gave them a, a good idea of how many years it would be. One man went on his knees in that courtroom and said, Judge, crying, I know you're sending me to jail, but I'm begging you, please. I'm begging you. I have the children outside, your wife, everybody. The pastor, don't send me to jail. I'm begging you. He said, I, would have, I, I mean, I changed my whole life. And I said, I'll tell you what. Justice demands that when you did the crime, you have to do the time. But I called in everybody who he said was outside. And I said to the pastor, I said, you're going to make sure you have a little something for him when he comes out? Yes. Wife, you're going to make sure that you're going to be faithful to him. At one point, I felt I was like a, a religious officer. You're going to be faithful to him. You're going to make sure so, so, so. And she looked at him. He looked a little scared when she wasn't saying it right away. <laughs> no, but it's really happened. And I said, be there for them. Because I want to throw out something else to you all. We all say when you do the crime, you must do the time, right? That's justice. When somebody does the time and they come out, and nobody there for them, is that injustice? Justice Pemberton, don't raise your hand because justice is not elusive. We have enough coming up to help them, all right? I find those hands in tight like that. I like that. Yes. All right, so again, I ask you the question, was justice done? And I'm happy to see that you're saying that it was yes. Because I want to explain to you again, you can only deliver the justice with what you have. Your duty is to deliver the justice. 
at the earliest time when it comes to you and it may not necessarily be in a courtroom. So what are these lists of interventions and initiatives? Criminal procedure rules. When the criminal procedure rules were passed less than, would be five years ago, it was 2017 rather, yeah? That now says straight in the courtroom and gives the judicial officers the teeth we were always looking for. Frowning on adjournments, matters are not to be adjourned. All matters are to be dealt with justly. Prosecution saying is what its case is, defense saying what its case is. One attorney stand up and say, the defense of my client is not guilty. Law one students, we did general defenses. You ever heard me teach you a defense call, not guilty? A torture necessity. Book out my right I might have said that. And criminal procedure rules. So we got the rules because people saying to the Chief Justice, well, you know, we can't do this. You got your rules now. You could ask for these things. You could say straight, which witnesses you're calling? Give their names. You're going to be two hours in cross-examination. Divide that by two and then minus 30 minutes. Maximum sentence indications. Accused who can now come before you and say, listen, if I were to plead guilty, how much you will give me? And that helps because people then know what, you know, young people in my days, I'm not young, we used to say damage. What do you all say? You know, how much is my damage? What do you all call it now? You all don't even know because you didn't get a better name than damage or better boot. <laughs> Plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is taking place now. We have docket system. Chief Justice said, you know how you get people to do things? You give them ownership. So instead of moving from court to court, this is your docket. These are your 200 matters which you have. It's like having children you're responsible for. No matter what you say, you're always responsible for them. All right? And now the docket system, not because anybody wants you to you know, put pressure on you. Why you get the docket system? Accountability, transparency. You could assess yourself. You could determine, okay, these are the ones for guilty pleas. These are MSIs. This is the one. So in other words, you got control of what you're doing. Sentence monitoring. That is something, again, uh, registrar may remember this when she was the registrar, Justice Bansi Sukai. You remember after sentencing, judge is told, you found us. But we wanted to know how people were going. And we, would have, we can't force them, but we would encourage them to come back. The only sad thing about that is when she was then the registrar, they didn't want to see me anymore. In fact, one day an accused came, she got ready, I said, um, you said Justice Saki couldn't come today. They said, yeah, we know, we want the pretty lady, please. You know, and, and, and she got ready, was that something you needed to tell me anyway? Status hearings, I did the status hearing already, where people in the prisons could come and ask us what's happening with their matter. Judge alone trials, we have judges doing the judge alone trials. Again, in control, getting things done, bail monitoring. Some people cannot, they don't have property, they can't raise the bail, provided they're not flight risk or they're not going to be threats to society. You put them on bail monitoring and you ask them to come back every six weeks. How are you going? What's going on? Bail supervision program. This was something that the former president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Honorable Justice Kamona, as he then was, and it's carried through. Carla, I know you did some of it. We have Justice Holdip doing it. And with bail supervision program, this is when persons are on bail awaiting trial but they're getting opportunities to work, to study, to build up that credit. Delayed sentencing, I gave you the example with respect to the bandits. JITT outreach program, this is what this is all about. A round of applause for the JITT, please. They really work very hard. This is one, I feel strongly about this. Review and suggestions for legislation. You see, we live in a very suspicious society. We live in a society, they criticize you when you do, they criticize you when you don't. You tell me the justice in the case. Judicial officers are aware that a piece of legislation is going to pass. And not just judicial officers. Let's say the judiciary. Remember, I told you the judiciary is court admin and judicial officers. You read the bill, the, the, the bill and you realize there's a problem. Are we meant to say nothing? You tell us. You want us to just say, listen, eh, wait till that come by us. We go show them. Why must we do, take that kind of attitude? David, I know I call him by, by first name, David and acting commissioner. When I was the director of the PCA, you know, many times they put my picture, David, I'm not handsome like you, you know. So when they wanted to get back at me, they were putting my picture, right? And when they put it, they vex up because I talk into the acting commissioner. At the time, it was then Mr. Stephen Williams and even before him, Mr. Dwayne Gibbs. And I was speaking with him, not to collude and let's see how we could undermine, but to say, listen, this is something happening with extrajudicial killings. Would you like me to come and talk about and, and, and lecture to your, your officers generally about what will be acceptable use of force? Faculty, remember self-defense? Reasonable use of force? Go on, go on, study that, please. Yeah. <laughs> Next week, Tuesday. Multiple choice, you still need to know it. And my point of view is, and perhaps this is because, as you would have heard from Dr. Alexis Francois, I wore many different caps. And there was nothing wrong when you were on opposing side for somebody to come and say, well, look, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? 
It is wrong if you say, well, you better do this or you better do that. But my view is, what is wrong if we have people talking, come, acting commissioner, what is wrong if you said to me, look, Gillian, I want to pass that pamphlet around with maximum sentence indication, hearings, or process. You might take in a look over at a pamphlet for me. What is wrong? Do you say anything wrong if, if the judiciary does it? But it must be clear, it must be open. Of course, I will get the boss's permission. Acting commissioner, if he says no, is no, eh? right. But you understand that that has never been the experience. But we want to see how we could help. Because you're telling us do more, and when we want to do more, you're telling us we're crossing lines. It's not about crossing lines. We live in a society in which we have to understand we're seeking to get everything moving without in any way undermining independence. Digitization. You all, all know about technology. It is the way to go. Not so. I saw students on Tuesday when I came here. A class was going on and they were busy doing their, on their phones. But I was sitting behind, so I was seeing everything. And when they went outside, I said, yes, you really want it. And so I'm looking at wedding pictures. Mm -hmm. Right. Digitization. That's where the courts have gone. Before COVID. I remember in 2018, before COVID, Chief Justice making the point, it's in his speech. There's the evidence they're saying that gone are the days with the big black book and your writing. Go now into the wood. And more important, if you feel that you're a dinosaur, and I always say Jurassic Park had a whole set of dinosaurs, so I don't see dinosaurs as a big thing, as a bad thing. But I'm saying you're getting the training, you're getting to learn. If people who are litigants don't know how to go on computers, do you know in the courts we have sent people to the homes of litigants? very accountable to assist them so that they can come into the virtual court. Yeah? And some of them ask for more lessons. Right? The family and children court where we recognize, okay, children now have to be treated differently when they are victims but also when they are accused. Virtual courts. The virtual courts where we had VAC centers. I may not use any legal kind of thing. I'm just saying where you could have gone, you don't have any kind of technology. You go to this center, we tell you which is your nearest center, and we give you the technology and we help you so you can have your parents in court. The Criminal Justice Sector Committee. Chief Justice, you chair that. And this is a committee in which you have representatives from all the stakeholders. And that is what you really need. Because the left hand must know what the right hand is doing. Right foot must know what left foot is doing. Nobody compromising, you know. But you're working in cohesion. And I'm very happy, Chief Justice, about that initiative. Because it mirrors what the National Justice um, Board does in the UK, where they recognized Dame Scotland. I think she was the first person who chaired it as Minister of Justice as she then was, to say, listen, you know, you needed to have this kind of, of, of understanding where we all are, so people could say, look, this is the problem, what you're doing. It's not anybody being the boss of the others, but everybody knowing what's happening. And of course, the drug treatment court, the recognition that everybody before the court charged with a drug offense is not a drug trafficker, but needs help. This is where now, now we're going okay, it's 10 past seven. I was told an hour and 10 minutes, I'm within the time. Everybody okay? But it's going to move a little faster on the train now, all right? Okay, good. If we look at this, again, you see the date. And I want to thank those who have shared these statistics with me because I wanted a realistic check. I also want, um, Minister, if you could just um, really, you know, shout out um, Mrs. Fazana, Nazir Mohammed, and her team. Because I speak with them, they speak with me. They're here? Where are you all? All right, and you got people to clap for you too. That's nice. Yeah, very good. And what, you know, by providing this, we know what's happening. And I'll tell you all what's going on. Huh? Look at this figure here. Call it 2,300. Look at this figure here. Let's call it 3,300. It means that we have 2,200, 2,300 people in remand. In remand could mean that they have been granted bail or not granted bail, or they've granted bail and they can't raise it. It could mean that they're awaiting trial. The 3,300 is the total number of people that you have in prison. How do we do? Some of them, of course, have already been found guilty, right? They would have been convicted. How do we deal with this 2300? And that is where, for the longest while, the Chief Justice, and I know it is something that was raised in this same um, criminal sector committee, we have in Trinidad and Tobago, and I checked this statistic, we have 90% of our matters going to trial. That's bad. Guess what? We're supposed to only have about 10% going to trial. So we have to turn around that ship to get people understanding 90% of your matters are supposed to be resolved without a trial, not without a court and not vigilante justice, by the way. What we're saying is through plea bargaining, through the MSIs, right? Through the fact that some of the persons in this number here may actually have been in remand for longer than their sentences would be if they were found guilty. And this is not, that's why I say justice is not elusive, because we know what we have to do. 
if you get 20 persons, whether coming from prison officers or wherever they may be, to crack the back of this, 20 persons, you're giving them about what? 100 matters each? And in other words, determine which ones have to go to trial. I mean, when I say not for them to determine, but who are persons who have been on remand for so many lengths of time, the decisions will have to be made. A very important office, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Give them a round of applause. They work very hard. And, and also, we now have the Public Defenders Department, the PDD. Give them a round of applause, led by Mr. Seen Sheikh. And in the Court of Appeal, we ask them when we're doing magisterial appeals to please have a presence. Poor things. They come every time. And uh, we want to thank them very much. So that right there on the virtual court, you're getting representation and very good representation of that. So what I'm saying is, this is what everybody is worried about. When I went to Massey Foods in Glencoe, I asked Jenna, Jenna, why, why do you think, what do you think about justice being elusive? She said, well, I'm not sure if it's elusive, but what I will tell you is this. Oh God, those cases taken long. And then I began talking about, when you go to Glencoe at 7 o'clock in the morning, they open true story. I saw her supervisor there looking at her. There were no other customers in the line. And I went to the supervisor and said, could I just engage her for a while? I've given you all her name. I said, could I engage her? The supervisor said, okay, no problem. And I said, listen, I'm going to do a survey. You may be the only person on the survey. So I was the only one person I did. Um, but I was asking her these questions. And then I said to her, I said, well, what if we did this and we did that and we did that? What do you think? She said, yeah. Then I go think that there is justice. And then, of course, the line started, you know, filling up. And then a man started cursing and saying, where the cashier, where the cashier? And then it was almost, I, I didn't need the chief justice to see me on the front page with that. And then this one, I want you to look at this one. No names called, the wrongly convicted. And I want to show you about how sometimes following due process, you could still have a problem. Even, I want to show you even with the best. Accused convicted for the offense of rape, 7-2 was a majority verdict. And the judge in that case, I could say the judge, just says Lionel Jones, his summations, which is what the Court of Appeal would look at, they were always meticulous, really took his time. And when the verdict was delivered, and I was going to the office right across the road. I found that the victim was looking unhappy. And the mother who had given evidence, her mother was looking like, yeah, 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 we get through, we get through. Which is not, in my view, how a mother should be when there's a guilty verdict. You know, she's more consoling and whatever. Anyway, the police officer, I call her name, um, Joanna Archie. She was her first case in the high court, or sexual offense case. I said to her, I said, go and check and see. Something is wrong. Long story cut short. After the verdict... The victim says she lied. The mother had told her to make up the story because the accused was 20 years younger than the mother. In fact, the accused was the friend of the mother's son. And I just want you all to know that we made contact with him very recently, as recently as last week, and I'll tell you why. Anyway, what do you do? Now, as a prosecutor, all the former prosecutors, didn't I do my job? I didn't lie. I disclosed everything. Now, I could have just said, no problem, and I'm gone. But obviously, you know that's not how we operate. What do we do? Called up the former director of um, public prosecutions, Mr. Benjamin, now deceased. I told him we have a problem. He said, could we wait for Monday? I said, no. He said, come up to Port of Spain. I did. I was crying. For the first time, I realized why the importance of it is better that 10 guilty men walk than one innocent man go to jail. It was the first time I really felt it. And I said, OK, let's see what we could do with the due process. And what we did is we had an emergency sitting. Um, he was given, the accused was given, bail pending appeal. It was his own bail, so he just had to sign. We conceded in the appeal when it came up, and the conviction of the accused was set aside. If the DPP's office didn't take that proactive approach, and the court didn't take, at that time I was a prosecutor, take the approach, that person would be serving a sentence. Because at the end of the day, he could have appealed, but what would he appeal on? What would he appeal on? And therefore I asked, was there justice? And do you understand, in this case, wasn't everything done? I prosecuted. The police did what they had to do. But what it called for all of us to do, everybody in that sector, is to take it up a notch. The mother has since passed away. And the sad part is, I'll just tell you, is that no name's called. He's still registered as having a conviction. And that is something, no, 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 not ah. Uh, we don't leave it at ah. Uh, that is being addressed. The court record is being pulled. Relax. Is justice being done? Yes. Relax. We're not going to leave it there, but look at it. I prosecuted that case in the 1990s. And do, do, have I given up on it? Has the police given up on it? Have the courts given up on it? Mr. Pemberton, how are we looking? Would you, would you raise your hand? All right, okay, good. The importance of restorative justice and civil society, and I know this is something very close to the heart of Senator the Honorable Mrs. Hazel Thompson-Ahi. 
And this is the point with restorative justice is concerned with the restoration of the parties that are affected by the commission of all offense. See this thing about lose them in jail? That's not the correct approach. It's not. Crime generally affects at least three parties, the victim, the community, the offender. Restorative justice approach seeks to remedy the adverse effects of crime in a manner that addresses the needs of all the parties involved. This is accomplished in part through the rehabilitation of the offender, reparations to the victim and the community, and the promotion of a sense of responsibility in the offender, and the acknowledgement of the harm done to victims and the community. And that's why I said, if you're using the philosophy, if you do the crime, you must do the time. When somebody does the time now and they come out, they're entitled to say, well, look, I did my time. I did what I was supposed to do. That's why I commend all those NGOs, Vision and Mission, and all the others who are giving support to persons after they come out of prison. And if we could give them a round of applause, I'd be grateful. Yeah, thanks. Because they really work very, very hard. And this is uh, something I wish that we had in Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm an advocate for it. I've been advocating for this since I wore another hat in another place that you would be familiar with, Minister. And the Criminal Cases Review Commission. And you would see here, it's an independent body, and it would have dealt with a situation like uh, that case for scenario I gave you. Because there are instances in which not justice, don't blame Lady Justice, she didn't fall through the cracks, you know. Something just happened, there was a kink. And this is what the Criminal Cases Review Commission does. And what they do now is, you go before them, some of you might have read in California, after 38 years, a man who was charged and found guilty of kidnapping and also rape, 38 years later, DNA evidence has shown it wasn't him. It was another person who happened to be a cellmate who died la the year before, and he committed the crime. It was his DNA. When somebody walks out after 38 years, even with the best intentions, nothing you could do. And now we come to the part. It's a call to action. And Dr. Esnard, I've used your phrase, a call to action. Education. And notice what I did. I started education with us. Students, I didn't start with you all. I started with us. And I'm happy to say in the JITT, we get that level of exposure. We get that understanding. We, we are taught what we are supposed to do. We may not always get it right first time. And when we don't get it right first time, travesty! But you students, if you don't pass my course first time, don't you want any supplemental? No supplemental for you. Pass first time. And judicial officers, attorneys at law, the executive and legislative arms of the state, we all need to understand why. Because as judicial officers, we start off with everybody thinking we're in an ivory tower. We don't really understand what's going on. And that's not true. You might be surprised at how many judicial officers and how many members of court administration are very involved in civic work and in NGOs helping. We need engagement of young people at an early age. What about the days? I asked a young person about six years old to recite, remember in our days, okay, all of you all under 18 wouldn't apply to you. Faculty wouldn't apply to you. But you all remember, um, no disrespect, front row, not you, minister. You all remember the pledge to the flag God bless our nation. I'm not going to ask you to sing it because some of you all just reached God bless our nation. What's the next sentence? But we were taught those things. And we have to engage young people to understand about a process and, and what it is to be fair and what it is to be decent and what it is to be compassionate. We also have to have the involvement of students at the primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. The JEITT is going out to schools before COVID. That was the plan. We said to everybody who is a judicial officer in court admin, you must have gone to school. Don't go and tell them all about being a judge. Don't go, but, but engage them. And we started. We went to schools. One of them, I noticed they're having a problem now, but that's because we didn't go to them during the, um, we couldn't go to them in COVID. I'm sure if we were going, they wouldn't have those problems now. We have to remove the complexity of the processes in the criminal justice system, which we have done. We have to increase opportunities for citizens to get legal services. That is done through the public defender's department. The availability and utilization of technology, and I spoke about that already. Timely and effective intervention of all stakeholders. A matter before me, long story cut short, boy, now a man before me, 26, he, he killed somebody when he was 16, came before me at age 26, judge alone trial. Turns out that six months before that killing, he had stabbed his cousin, who had, who had treated him badly because he had been taking electricity, which we know is wrong, and the cousin had just gone pull the plug, and he didn't like what the cousin did. Probation officer was supposed to monitor the boy, and fortunately, he wasn't monitored. You know, and at the end of the day, when I asked him something that I remember Master Morris Allen saying, do like what they do, Justice Bansi Sukai, you will know it from the children court. I asked the accused, I told him, I said, I want justice in this case. I found you guilty, not a jury, I found you guilty. Tell me what you think would be a just sentence for you. And he stood up, 
And he said to me, he said, I like sewing and I want, if you could help me with sewing. You know what his story was? When he was six or seven years old, there was a flood and he had jumped into the flooded drain to save a friend. And when they revived him, he was coming in and out of um, consciousness. And what they recognized then is that he might have had a mental challenge. Nobody saw about that boy. Nobody. And again, sentence monitoring, you're just asking them how they're going. Now, I know he committed the crime when he was under 18 and there are things in place for it. But I'm just saying, if we had had the timely intervention, when I'm talking about when he saved that young boy, you know, his friend, to just for somebody to say, well, look, if he's having some kind of mental challenge, let's see what we could do to help. And community outreach. In fact, Chief Justice had agreed to this again before COVID, that we would follow what some other countries have done. You put your court in a van and you go to remote areas. And you could actually conduct court in a van. But we don't have money to buy a van. And um, it's not a food truck. We do not want a food truck. And okay, and... Some people very excited because they thought it'd be nice to, you know, go and see the place. So it's really a call to action. Our role in addressing the matter of crime, I make no apology for saying this. Return to faith and family. I'm not making, even if you are agnostic, return to faith and family. And Carissa, Carissa, could you come on stage, please? Yes, come on stage. That's what they do in Hollywood all the time. They call you out. I want you all to give a round of applause for Carissa because this is actually what Carissa said. Carissa, where you went? Carissa, come forward. When we were doing this, Carissa said, and I will just imitate her. I can imitate her. She said this. Judge, I tell you, street. You have to put a slide, return to faith and family. That's what it is, return to faith and family. And we put it right there. And look at the applause you got. You got more than me, Carissa. <laughs> acting. So are you acting with the commissioner? I just don't want to demote you. I'd rather call you commissioner. Right, okay. Prison service led. This pamphlet, and this is what I mean. To do this pamphlet, which was circulated to all the prisoners, you needed to make sure you got it right. You don't want to tell the prisoners when you come, you'll, you'll get something that they, they're not entitled to or they won't get something they're entitled to. So who you think should look over this? Uh, right, but you would do it openly. But you don't go on and say, okay, hold on. Those are in commission. Yeah, 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 yeah. What is wrong if we just, we're not telling people what sentences they will get? And this is a Q&A. And you know how many of them would come and tell us they have their MSI paper with them? Yes. Well, judge, you will remember that when you took over because they wanted the pretty lady. And remember these three C's. The three C's are communication, collaboration, and cohesion. And as I end, I stand by the position. My position is justice is not elusive. What about you? I thank you very much for your attention. Oh, Carissa, if I might, just the vote. Justice oh, yes. Pemberton, don't feel any pressure. <laughs> but those hands crossed for too long now. You would remember where you voted, and for those of you who didn't vote, I just want to ask, how many of you of the view that justice is elusive after this? How many of you of that view? Okay, good. That's a good stretch. That's a good stretch. And how many of you of the view that it is not elusive? Right. And how many of you want to come back and vote when we have like what they're doing in another country, we'll come back and vote the next time. Right? We'll have a runoff. Thank, thank you very much again. Thank you very, very much, Justice Lucky. As, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, I really want to extend um, just my heartfelt thanks, Judge. You have given us a much better understanding, I will say, of the justice system and also you have reflected on the important role that each of us, all the roles that we have to play, and the institutions, it's not just a one-party show, it's all of us working together to move the needle in this very serious matter. So let's say thanks again to Justice Lucky.